No, it's welcome to week six, or unit six of our lecture in living in the IT era. For this week, we will be talking about common computing devices using a workstation and operating system. For this lesson, we are going to answer the following essential questions. Number one, what are the computer hardware and software? Personal computers, mobile, and IoT devices. As well as what are the types and functions of an operating system and how to perform basic troubleshooting and support. For our intended learning outcomes, we will examine the different parts of the computer system and the categories of computer peripherals and assess why computers are considered powerful thinking machines. Desktop and workstation computers as seen on this particular diagram and as discussed on our earlier lectures have different purposes and function. Mainly the term desktop and workstation have been interchanged, but usually we pertain to desktop computers are as the computers that are used by individual PC users for a workstation are more commonly found in particular office or company and is fully connected to a network. Based on this diagram, we can see that a desktop or a workstation computer consists of a computer hardware the output components, such as display speakers or printer, as well as input components, which makes use of the keyboard and the mouse. With regards to computers, we can further segregate them into all-in-one computers, which are computers where in the monitor or display, storage, processor, and memory are integrated in one form factor with connections such as the USB, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and the legs already available in one device. So when we say all-in-one computers or AIO computers, these computers have everything built in together with the display. And all we need to do is to hook up input or output components to the actual device. Majority of all-in-one computers are either Mac or Windows. So it is not very common to find an all-in-one computer running on Linux or other operating system. Servers. Servers, on the other hand, serves as the main processing unit that caters resource-heavy processes such as data repository, data database processing unit or served services such as websites or email. Server are computers were in different smaller computers connect to in order to get data or process a particular service. Laptop. Laptop are portable computers and they can have various types depending on the size, form factor, and operating system used. Among the main classifications are, we have the notebook or the, the actual laptop itself. The general term for a full-size laptop that strikes a balance between portability and functionality. They can vary greatly in overall size and specifications, such as the processor speed, storage capacity, memory, and screen size. We also have what we call the ultra portables, which are thin and light laptops designed for mobility and are often described as ultra portables or sometimes called a sub notebook. They maintain a super slim profile, which means they have to cut up some features such as larger connection ports and reduce the number of connection ports. The smallest model weighs about a kilogram. Ultrabook is a term coined by computer chip maker Intel 
for a special type of ultra portable notebook or ultra book. They must meet specific criteria for various things such as size, weight, battery life, or chipset, which includes built in security updates. Among their strong points is strong security and anti theft protection built in at the hardware level. Although the original MacBook Air is regarded as the inspiration for the Ultrabook class, it's not actually an Ultrabook. We also have what we call Chromebook, which runs on the Chrome OS, which it in itself is based on the Linux OS. These are designed to work primarily with web apps and data being saved to the cloud rather than on the laptop itself. Apps need to be downloaded from the Chrome Web Store Recent model Chromebooks can also run Android apps. They are popular in some schools or even corporate groups because they are cheaper and their minimal configuration offers easier centralized administration and security. So Chromebooks are basically just like tablets, Android tablets, but most of the apps run on the cloud or through the Android apps. MacBook. Apple's laptop computers comes in two family, the ultra thin 13 inch MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro in 13, 14, and 16 inches. They all run the Mac OS operating system. The latest version of the MacBook have abandoned Intel's platform and are now running on Apple's own M1 chipset which integrates everything on a single chip. This gives Apple total control of tight integration of hardware and software, resulting in significant boosts in speed and battery life. We also have what we call convertibles or two-in-one. They combine the features of laptop and tablet. Thus, they are also called two-in-one laptop or hybrid. They can, quickly, they can quickly switch between touchscreen tablet mode and traditional keyboard mode, transforming in a variety of ways, including detaching, sliding, twisting, and fold-back mechanisms. Most models now use the fold-back method, though a few still have detachable screens. We can also use or repurpose a tablet as a laptop. Just as convertible laptops can do double duty as a tablet, some tablets, tablets can be used as a laptop with the addition of the detachable keyboard. Most notable for this are Windows-based tablets such as the Surface Pro or Surface Go, which really benefit from having a keyboard as they use the Windows OS. However, unlike a two-in-one, they can quickly be used in tablet mode without the added bulk and weight of a keyboard. The iPad and the iPad Pro also have detachable keyboards and can be used as laptops. Though they use Apple's iPadOS operating system and works best with apps that support laptop functionality. Samsung also has several tablets that can add an optional keyboard to work as a laptop using either Windows or Android. And lastly, we have the Netbook, which was the name of a class of small and cheap laptop PCs designed for internet connected computing. These small laptops were for several years very popular because they were cheap, but the trade-off was that they were also slow and cost-cutting showed in many ways, particularly in low RAM, CPU, and storage. They use Intel's low-powered Intel Atom processor. These days, you'll find more capable replacements in tablets, ultrabooks, portables, particularly Chromebooks. So these are some of the PC and laptop vendors. We have Razer, Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, HP, Acer, Lenovo, Dell, Apple, and Microsoft. So to be reminded that smartphone and tablets are also considered as computers. Some can even run faster, if not as fast as modern computers. So smartphone and tablets only are differentiated, particularly in their size, but with regards to tablet, tablets under Android, they run the same operating system. And with regards to smartphone and tablets on under Apple, they run on two different operating systems. The Apple Smartphone runs on iOS, whereas the tablet 
runs on iPad OS. Internet of Things. The Internet of Things, or IoT, is a system of interrelated computing devices, mechanical and digital machines, objects, animals, or people that are provided with a unique identifier and the ability to transfer data over a network without requiring human-to-human -human or human-to-computer interaction. The main concept of a network of smart devices was discussed as early as 1982 with a modified Coca-Cola vending machine at Carnegie Mellon University becoming the first ARPANET connected appliance. It was able to report its inventory and whether newly loaded drinks were cold or not. Mark Weiser's 1991 paper on ubiquitous computing, computer of the 21st century, as well as academic venues such as UBCOMP and PERCOMP produced a contemporary vision of the IoT. In 1994, Reza Raji, described the concept in IEEE spectrum as moving small packets of data to a large set of nodes, thus integrate and automate everything from home appliances to entire factories. Between 93 and 97, several companies proposed solutions like Microsoft at Work or Novel's Nest. The field gained momentum when Bill Joy envisioned device-to-device -device communication as part of his six webs framework presented at the world Economic Forum at Davos in 1999. The concept of the Internet of Things and the term itself first appeared in a speech by Peter T. Lewis to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation 15th Annual Legislative Weekend in Washington, D.C., published in September 1985. According to Lewis, the Internet of Things, or IoT, is integration of people, processes, and technology with connectable devices and sensors to enable remote monitoring, status manipulation, and evaluation of trends of, of such devices. The term IoT was coined independently, or Internet of Things was coined independently by Kevin Ashter, Ashton of Procter & Gamble, later MIT's Auto ID Center in 1999. Though he prefers to praise Internet for things, at that point he viewed RFID, as essential to the Internet of Things, allowing computers to manage all individual things. The main theme of the Internet of Things is to embed short change mobile receivers or transceivers in various gadgets and daily necessities to enable new forms of communication between people and things, and between things themselves. Next are the concept of modern cars and drones. As we are all aware, Right now, cars are becoming more interconnected with the internet, more precisely with the advent of electric cars, people have been able to connect to various parts such as sensors and other equipments found inside the car so through the use of a uh, modern operating system we can now run android or ios in the modern car also there is an interconnection between the components of the car to the main car computer which manages the battery status of the tire pressure as well as things like the air condition of the modern car. Now, although the modern electric car started at around the early 2000s, electric cars have been around since the 1800s. So, for example, Robert Anderson is often credited in inventing the first electric car sometime between 1832 and 1839. The following experimental electric cars appeared during the 1880s. For example, in 1881, Gustave Tauvet presented an electric car at the Exposition Internationale d'Electricité de Paris, or de Paris. Gustave Tauvet's first electric vehicle in 1881 was the world's first publicly presented full-scale electric car. So imagine, even before the advent of gasoline, 
or diesel-powered engines. Electric cars were being developed during the 1800s, during the late 1800s. In 1884, over 20 years before the Ford Model T, which is one of the most famous mass assembled car or a car for the masses. Thomas Parker built an electric car in Wolverhampton using his own specially designed high capacity rechargeable batteries. Although the only documentation is a photograph from 1895. In 1888, the German Andreas Flocken designed the Flocken electro wagon regarded by some as the first real electric car. Electricity was among the preferred methods for automobile propulsion in the late 19th and early 20th century, providing a level of comfort and ease of operation that could not be achieved by gasoline-driven cars at the time. The electric vehicle fleet peaked at approximately 30,000 vehicles at the turn of the 20th century. In 1897, electric cars first found commercial use as taxes in Britain and in the U.S. In London, Walter Percy's electric cabs were the first self-propelled propelled vehicles for hire at a time when cabs were horse-strong. So imagine electric taxis were already used during the time when most taxis were being pulled by horses. In New York City, a fleet of 12 handsome cabs and one broham based on the design of the Electrobat 2 form part of a project funded in part by the Electric Storage Battery Company of Philadelphia. During the 20th century, the main manufacturers of electric vehicles in the U.S. included Anthony Electric, Baker, Columbia, Anderson, Edison, Riker, Melbourne, Bailey Electric, and Detroit Electric. Their electric vehicles were quieter than gasoline-powered ones and did not require gear changes. Six electric cars held the land speed record in the 19th century. The last of them was the rocket-shaped La Jamais Content, driven by Camille Genatsky, which broke the 100 km per hour or 62 miles per hour speed barrier by reaching a top speed of 105.88 km per hour in 1899. Electric cars remained popular until advances in internal combustion engine cars and mass production of cheaper gasoline and diesel-powered vehicles led to a decline. Internal combustion engine cars much quicker refueling times and cheaper production costs made them more popular. However, a decisive moment came with the introduction in 1912 of the electric starter motor that replaced often laborious methods of starting the internal combustion engine, such as hand cranking. So through electric starter motor, which is used up, uh, up until today, it spelled the doom for the electric car because through the use of an electric starter motor, it was easier to start an internal combustion engine that is powered by either a gasoline or diesel. Modern electric cars, on the other hand, started in the early 1990s when the California Air Resources Board began a push for more fuel efficient, lower emission vehicles with the ultimate goal of a move to zero emission vehicles such as electric vehicles. In response, automakers developed electric models. These early cars were eventually withdrawn from the U.S. market. California electric automaker Tesla Motors began development in 2004 of what would become the Tesla Roadster, first delivered to customers in 2008. It was the first highway legal all-electric car to use lithium-ion battery cells and the first production all-electric car to travel more than 320 kilometers per charge. The Mitsubishi IMEF, launched in 2009 in Japan, was the first highway legal series production electric car and the first all-electric car to sell more than 10,000 units. Several months later, the Nissan Leaf surpassed the IMEF as the best-selling all-electric car at that time. Computers are also used for medical devices, such as MRI, cardiogram, 
and other computerized diagnostics found in uh, modern laboratories today. So most of them use a different operating system. While some are interconnected to Windows in order to extract and process this data. So we have a video link here showing how computers interact in, with medicine or med medical devices. One such example is the use of robots for surgeries. Next are gaming consoles. Gaming consoles are actually computer devices which has a custom operating system which caters to playing multimedia, particularly games. So for the modern uh, gaming consoles, which started from the family computer way back in the early 1980s up until the more modern gaming consoles such as the PS5 and the Xbox One X and the Nintendo Switch. These devices are actually computers whose main purpose is to interact and uh, give information via the particular gaming console. These are usually lower powered than their computer counterparts or than their personal computer counterparts because their main purpose is only to render multimedia or render games on the television screen. So although gaming consoles might not look like an actual computer. The internals are the same as that of the modern personal computers. Setting up your devices, consider the following. When setting up computer devices, we need to consider the following. Environments, is the environment suitable for the computer? We have to take note that computers because they consume electricity, generate a lot of heat. The environment wherein you will place your computer as well as connected devices should have ample air and ample exhaust so as heat can be properly dissipated. The environment should also be minimally free of dust because they can interact and they can enter the internals or internal parts or components of your computer when air is sucked inside your computer devices. Installation safety for yourself and for passersby. Remember that because we are using electricity and the computers are generating heat, it must be installed in an area where users can safely use them. You must also be reminded that uh, connections such as wiring must be properly installed. Otherwise, there is a risk of electric shock. And lastly, installation healthy to use. So when we say installation healthy to use, is the installation properly done so that the, co the computing device or the computer can be used safely and effectively without harming the end user. So we must take note of that. Setting up a personal computer. Now, if you are a beginner or if you are not familiar with setting up a personal computer, whether that be a Macintosh, a Windows, or a Linux PC, you have to be reminded that um, 
personal computer has separate parts that you need to connect in order for the computer to work. Now, this is a basic uh, video that I pulled from YouTube showing the different things that you must consider when connecting your PC or setting up your PC. So the first is um, unpacking. Of course, if your computer is new and it's inside the box, you have to unpack your computer from the box, okay? So usually when you are purchasing uh, a package desktop computer or a pre-built desktop computer, you will have a monitor, the computer main unit, which consists of the storage, the hard drive, the motherboard, the processor, and the memory. And in some instances, it might also have a video card, a dedicated video card, or a built-in video card. And then um, it comes with wires and cables. And then more often than not, it's also bundled with a keyboard and a mouse. Now, sometimes speakers are included, but sometimes they are not. So you have to remove all the hindrances from the ports, like there might be some cover, plastic covering, or uh, tapes attached to your unit. So you have to make sure that those are removed and they are properly laid out on, preferably on a computer table or on your desk. The first thing that you have to do when setting up your PC is connecting your monitor to the main computer unit. So after that, you have to locate your monitor cable. So we have different types of cable as we have um, studied before. It could be a VGA, DVI, or in some newer monitors, it comes with HDMI port. So the HDMI port has two ends. So the first end goes to your video card in your um, computer unit. And then the other end goes to the, usually at the back of your monitor. Okay. So you have to make sure that it is properly plugged at the back of your system unit. Always take note of the shape and the size. Do not force your cables otherwise it might break that either the cable or the system unit itself okay after you have successfully plugged in your computer cable monitor to the back of your monitor and your system unit the next step is to connect the keyboard and the mouse so the keyboard and the mouse also goes to the back of your system unit. Now the keyboard and the mouse usually are of the USB interface, but it might also be via Bluetooth. Now, if your keyboard and mouse are connected via Bluetooth, and it is your initial setup for the desktop PC, it is recommended to have a wired keyboard and mouse first because you need to set them up inside the operating system because you need to turn on the Bluetooth connection of your operating system and configure the OS to accept your Bluetooth or your uh, 2.4 gigahertz wireless devices. Once that is done, If you have speakers or headphones, you need to connect your speaker and headphones to the back 
of your uh, system unit if they are wired and if they are wireless, the same step that you have undergone with your mouse and keyboard that are wireless must also be followed. After doing that, we could now connect the power cord for the monitor and for the system unit. The power cord is usually the big black and hefty cable that is found and usually is placed at the back of your monitor or system unit. It usually has two to three um, flat poles. Now, it is recommended to plug in your um, computer unit to either an AVR or automatic voltage regulator or a UPS or uninterruptible power supply. This is because if you just connect your PC to an ordinary outlet, it might interfere or it might have or it might capture um, unstable current or sometimes electric surges, which will damage your system unit or your monitor. So you have to make sure that it is you are using a proper Malina, power sorry. connection. Okay. When setting up a laptop on it, on the other hand, you do not need to set up the monitor. You do not need to set up the keyboard and the mouse, not unless you are using a wireless keyboard or mouse. All you need to do is to set up, open your laptop from the box if it is new, and then plug in the power supply. Also, you do not need to plug in the laptop in a surge protector, an AVR, or UPS because it already has a battery. And usually the power adapter also has safety mechanisms in it. But just to be safe, it is better if you could plug it at least in an ABR or an outlet with the surge protector. Okay, let's go with the topic of ergonomics. When we say ergonomics, it is the study of factors affecting the performance of people at work. It is well established that a poor working environment can cause certain health problems and decrease productivity. Among those usually affected are people sitting in the office for too long. They usually, they have uh, concerns with their spinal column, with their uh, back or bottoms. They also have problems with their eyesight. Okay, so it is important that you follow proper ergonomics when you sing and sitting down the computer for a long time. There should be proper keyboard and mouse placement as well as proper sitting position and monitor placement. I have a video here wherein you can watch what is computer ergonomics. So kindly read and watch this particular video. One of the problems associated with Improper computer ergonomics is carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a common condition that causes pain, numbness, and tingling in the hand and arm. It occurs when one of the major nerves of the hand, the median nerve, is squeezed or compressed as it travels through the wrist. There's also issues with your vision. Um, either you, you will become farsightedness or nearsightedness, requiring you to wear prescription glasses. Let's go with the last topic, which is navigating an operating system. The samples included here are for Windows, but it can also be applied for Mac, as well as Linux that employs a GUI. If you do not know, most Linux installations are using a command prompt or like a DOS-based interface, but you can install utilities that allows it to use GUI interfaces just like in Windows or in Mac. So first you have to sign in to your operating system and then from the taskbar you could uh, select the applications that you want. On the right side there, that is the notification area and usually you use it to um, connect to a network 
see news, view updates, and the likes. You can also customize the start screen and the taskbar. You can add or remove icons. Okay. As well as certain pop-ups. When using a mouse or a touchpad, I think you are all familiar with it. So I will not tell that one. And when you are using a touch screen, it depends on the particular operating system that you have. So usually touch screen uh, employs click, double click, or uh, sorry, tap, double tap, pinch, pinch in, pinch out, usually to zoom in and zoom out. Or uh, sometimes um, you could have two fingers on the screen to do a certain particular task. And then we also have the icons. So the icons are usually dependent on the operating system. And that is all for this week for our Unit 6 lecture in Living in the ID. Yeah. Thank you and take care.